Good evening, everyone. Apologies for the small delay. It seems we have a technical difficulty. I'm for a political people's party. Welcome to another episode of EPP Family Talks. Over the past several weeks, we've had the pleasure of speaking with leaders from throughout our political family about the ideas and projects they've been working on during this time of coronavirus crisis. This evening, it is our great pleasure to welcome Mr. Paolo Rangel, Vice Chair of the EPP Group in the European Parliament and Vice President of the European People's Party. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, Mr. Rangel. Welcome, thank you so much for taking time to speak with you. Asking all of this series, just a personal question, and that is, how are you doing? How have you adapted? How have you been coping these past several weeks? Well, uh, I must say I'm fine. Uh, I'm really fine. Uh, uh, I have been working very, very hard. Uh, so since the 11th of March, it was the day that uh, I came from Brussels to Porto, my town where I'm now, I'm confined to home. So I've been at home almost all the time. So normally only leaving to go to the supermarket or to the pharmacy if it is needed. And so uh, I've been working very hard. So in such a manner that I have video conferences all the time. So even this afternoon, I had three video conferences. So this is the third, I'd say, uh, video event where I am. Uh, and normally I start very early because you probably know I'm involved in this organization of the Conference of Future of Europe. And so it's so much work that I used to say, uh, uh, probably you know that in Portuguese and by the way, also in Spanish, the word life is vida. And uh, I say, I don't have, now I don't have uh, uh, vida, I have vida conference because <laughs> I'm in a permanent conference. So it's a permanent conference call. So not video conference, but video conference. And so uh, I've been working much more than I used to. So, uh, but that's the, 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 the good thing. And that is the reason why I said in a very, I'd say strong manner, I'm fine. Is because when you have to, so much work and you are so dedicated, then you don't have time to be pressed. Because I believe that uh, for some people, this time of uh, confinement to stay at home was a bit depressing. But in my case, I had so much things to do, uh, always working, always, uh, I'd say, network and connecting with uh, especially the European Parliament uh, uh, activities that uh, I had no time to be sad. And that's the reason why I say I'm fine. Well, whether we're talking about Vita or video, we can't get away from Latin. So that's sort of one 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 uh, point yes. to note there. I would be very interested to hear about all the different committees you're in and all the different work you're doing, all the different files you're involved in. But maybe first, a question uh, just we've also been asking all of our leaders, and that is just to update us on your own home country. So, what is the situation? What is the situation like now on the ground in Portugal? Well, I say that uh, in Portugal the situation was uh, uh, fairly positive when compared with other European southern countries, and uh, namely with Spain, that is our neighbor, our only neighbor. So Portugal has only a border with Spain, then the other border is the Atlantic. Um, and and uh, uh, it was really amazing how we cope to avoid such uh, chaos and difficulty and complex situation as the northern of Italy or Spain. And this was, in my opinion, because the Portuguese people reacted quite early. So in a certain way, we were privileged because as we are a peripheral country, uh, well, the virus came uh, one week later, I'd say. And so there was time, but it was a spontaneous reaction from the people. So it was not the government that was directing the process. It was, I'd say, the civil society, the population, the entrepreneurs, the workers that decided to start with confinement. In a certain way, they demanded from the government to take decisions. And uh, 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 at the same time, there was a, a big political consensus. So the president of the Republic, that, by the way, was a former president of our party, and it was the one that was responsible uh, for our party to join the EPP, he was the, the, the president that signed the uh, accession of EPP to, of our party, PST, to EPP. Uh, he uh, uh, made a huge conference with government and also our leader of the position was very collaborating. So there was a national unity 
also in the very strict and difficult measures of confinement. And so I think that we managed especially to avoid uh, what would be a clear uh, risk to, to have the hospitals completely full and occupied by people with COVID-19. This was avoided and I think this was really uh, very important uh, to, 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 to say that now we have a quite comfortable situation. Of course, we have to be very careful. Uh, to, I say the main focus was in the northern region, so uh, uh, here, uh, very near from my town. But uh, now the problem is more in Lisbon. And so uh, even if it is totally, I'd say, sold, uh, I say that the, the, the main focus that we in the capital region now uh, and so uh, but things are i say uh, evolving pretty well we started already the deconfinement and so now shops are open uh, uh, a lot of, of uh, 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 churches are going to open next uh, sunday so uh, the first of june the football will uh, start in the middle of june and so things will uh, return to what we call the new normality so <laughs> Well, let's move to looking at some of the things you're working on in your portfolios in the European Parliament. So, for example, well, just maybe maybe a general question first. What would you see looking back as so far the main challenges and also so far the main successes which the EU has had thus far? Well, I must say that uh, even if I have very, very uh, relevant uh, portfolios, of course, as the vice chair of the group and as head of the Portuguese delegation, I had a huge responsibility in this uh, uh, dossier of the recovery uh, strategy. So for Portugal, this was very important because we have a high debt, a high public debt. Uh, we have improved the situation since the Troika times, but we are still at risk, I say, uh, because uh, the debt is very huge and the main threat to the Portuguese economy is uh, to have a kind of, uh, I'd say, a new debt uh, in such a, a, a way, in such a, a volume or a quantity of new credits that that could create uh, again a big struggle like the one that we had in the eurozone crisis or the sovereign debt crisis. And so this is uh, uh, this was our main concern to create a consensus in European Parliament in order to, uh, I say, help uh, all the countries that need it. And this was really EPP-9. So I think that the plan, it is a quite good one and quite, I'd say, uh, uh, solid one that was presented yesterday. It had the DNA, I'd say, the fingerprint of EPP. And uh, I'm very proud that uh, uh, me, together with my colleagues from uh, our party, we have worked in a very intense and constructive manner to reach this consensus. I want to pick up just exactly on that note first. Let me just apologize to our viewers if they see the, our, our visual, our video going in and out. I think we're doing this interview at peak internet usage time. So just uh, hopefully the audio is fine. I, my understanding is that the audio is fine. So you mentioned several ways in which the you're, as you mentioned, you're a vice chair of the EPP group in the European Parliament, a vice president of the party. In the party, you're also the chair of one of our working groups on membership. You're the chair of our ethics committee. So maybe could you just expand a little bit more on other ways or, or all the different ways you see the EPP family in particular showing leadership now? Yes. Well, one was really this dossier. Another one that is very important for me as EPP vice president responsible for membership is the, the, the relationship with the countries that are not members of the European Union. I'm thinking about uh, the uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, countries like Ukraine or Georgia or Moldova or Armenia. Uh, 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 and I'm thinking also about the countries of the Balkans, the Western Balkans. And as I have a very close relationship with them, that is not only political, today I'd say is really uh, uh, even a, a heart relation. So uh, I discovered a lot of uh, ties and links and uh, uh, even a feeling of belonging with them. I was very worried that the European Union could not help 
uh, these countries uh, to to cope with the situation of the pandemic and and so uh, especially to one that uh, I have a very a very big responsibility that is Bosnia Herzegovina uh, because I'm the standing rapporteur of the European Parliament and so I have a, I'd say a double responsibility one in Parliament and another in the party and so uh, I think that was also important. To, to keep, I'd say, the, the, the doors open to have this cooperation and collaboration. And for instance, it was for me a privilege to, to be in the summit of the Western Balkans that was organized by our prime minister from Croatia, Plenkovic, and also with our president uh, of the party, uh, Donald Tusk, very, very engaged. And so uh, for me that uh, I had this, this, I'd say, this really awareness that we needed to help them in these very difficult times, it was really good to see that EPP was in the front line, uh, really creating these ties, this help, this capacity of dialogue with these countries in a very difficult moment also for them. I have one more sort of serious question, policy related question for you, and I want to try an experiment, actually. So the question I wanted to ask you is about concrete next step. So you've mentioned the very important recovery plan, which was put forward just this week. So maybe that's one thing you would talk about. But I wanted to also bring in a question from one of our viewers, uh, Beatriz, and it's in Portuguese. So you could respond to this in English or in Portuguese as you like. The, the gist of the question, I think, is basically, will we see more integration of political sectors sort of after the, this crisis? I could actually just read you the question in Portuguese. Uh, my, I have some Portuguese. Será que este vírus veio impulsionar a maior integração de políticas setoriais que estavam confinadas? And that's so, from Be Beatriz. First, I so to, I think there, there's something there about sort of next steps as well. Yes, yes, of course. So I have first to, to, to say, to praise uh, Nathan because he, 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 he really speaks very good Portuguese, uh, <laughs> even with a Brazilian accent that, by the way, in a certain way, is even more Carioca. <laughs> yes, yes, because it's more important than Portuguese because it's, we are speaking about 200 million people no? And by the way, I'd like to give a, a strong word to Brazil because they are facing now a very, very difficult situation in health terms. Uh, they are living really uh, a very, very, very concerning moment. And also in political terms, they are in a, in a very struggling situation and so i'd like to, to 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 say that but then after this i'd say that i fully believe that the COVID crisis has created an awareness to 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 give some steps more in our integration process and this is quite clear with the project that was yesterday presented by president uh, of the commission uh, ursula von der leyen but also i'd say uh, for instance in my case that I'm responsible, I'm a member of LIBE, uh, the Committee of Liberties in, 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 in European Parliament and uh, of the Working Group of Schengen. And I think that one of the main challenges that we will have, and that is not an economic one, is a political one, is to reopen the borders and how we should reopen the borders. Because there was a very strong lack of coordination uh, uh, we should say, uh, when we decided to close the borders, there was no coordination. It was a, a single state, uh, state by state, member state by member state decision without any coordination. And that's it because the Schengen system doesn't uh, uh, foresee any capacity of the Commission to intervene in this uh, domain in such a situation. Uh, but now, I think that we have to coordinate efforts because we will lose single market, we will lose freedom of circulation of people in the first place, but also of goods, of services, uh, uh, if we don't open the borders with some uh, coordinated strategy. And so I'd say this is really, uh, for me, the, 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 the main uh, challenge that we have in political terms in the next month, is to reopen the borders, the Schengen border, to have a common and large European space all across the continent. Well, I'd like to move to a final section of the uh, of the interview, which is sort of more personal, more informal questions. 
uh, sort of a lightning round, if we could, in the last few minutes. And actually, I'll just pick up on the, the last thing you said, which is a very important issue of borders, which now uh, has the implication, one of the implications this is having now is people are talking about the tourist season and you know how do we get people moving across the continent again in a safe and a responsible way. So you're there in a, in a beautiful part of the continent in Portugal with sun, the sea is not so far away. So my question would be- In this be, case, it's one kilometer far. <laughs> You, uh, you, you probably can smell it. Um, <laughs> yes. So it as, on as the days, but, uh, uh, it's it's common to smell it. Yes. Well, as travel restrictions begin to lift, is there a place you yourself would most like to go as soon as you're able to? Well, uh, I'm I'm going to tell you that I would like to go some somewhere, but I didn't decide yet where to because I have no information about what we can do. And so uh, I'm 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 really looking forward to have a bit more information about what is going to be opened, how we can travel in the next month. Uh, but uh, I would like really to uh, to go abroad someday, uh, ten days or fifteen days maximum. But I would like to do it somewhere in Europe. So uh, within Europe, that is clear. Then let's see if it will be something like Greece or if it will be something like. Uh, uh, Netherlands or Denmark. So I'm open to. Normally I go north because uh, I live in a, a quite, uh, I'd say, pleasant country in terms of temperature. And so normally I look uh, uh, something not so hot or not, not so warm. Well, Porto is not so hot as people think. It's quite warm, but not hot and never cold. So it's, uh, it's uh, very uh, in the middle, I'd say, uh, very moderate and very very pleasant but so i i would like to see uh, to search for some place but i haven't thought yet about it so I, I i've decided i will go but i don't know where all those are very good options i think <laughs> yeah. my next question is uh about a historical figure whom you might have found particularly inspirational to consider in these past few weeks here in addition to being a politician you're also a professor so this may be a particularly appropriate question to ask you. Does well, somebody come I'm, to mind? I'm going to tell you that uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, probably people are, are thinking about politicians that uh, have the capacity to resist uh, in very difficult times and to inspire people and so on. But I would choose Leonardo da Vinci uh, because we need innovation, we need creativity for the new times that are coming. And also because it's Italian, and Italy represents mm. all the suffering that the continent has had. So they were the first and probably one of the more the most touched by this. So uh, if we are able uh, to uh, understand what should be the trends for the next generation. By using that word Odyssey there, you've also just invoked the great classical tradition of Greece as well. Um, so well then it was something we had a, a nice time discussing with Vice President Skinas a few weeks ago. My final question is, is there a book or a film or series you've recently watched or read which you would recommend to people? Well, I, I wouldn't say uh, something that I have done recently. Uh, I have watched one or two films, not so much because the time was not so. I, I have read a lot, but more for academic purpose about the English Revolution and so the English 17th, 17th century, but I would say that I would recommend one of the books of my life. And it came to my mind a lot of times during this uh, moment of, I'd say, uh, confinement, where you have also some room for meditation and to see what is really important in your life. When you see that a small virus can change everything, then you also are confronted with your own destiny as a human being. And then I, I would suggest uh, a, a classical uh, from Marguerite Yusrenard, so a French, uh, that is uh, Memoir d'Adrien, so what we call it, the uh, Adrian Memories. It's a Roman emperor again, but also with a very Hellenic, uh, I say, uh, background. And especially uh, uh, during this, uh, I'd say, this trip, or because it's a kind of uh, uh, trip through his own life. He's in the the the, the 
I'd say, the end of his life. And so he's reflecting on everything that happened to him and in a very human manner. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, it is really something that inspired me to say that in these times we have also an opportunity to think about our spirituality, about our deepen uh, conscience, so uh, uh, about the essential things of life, not only the day-to-day -day life, not only this, this uh, very crazy thing of being uh, connected uh, 10 uh, hours a day with video conferences that is so bad as going, uh, 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 as traveling by, uh, by plane uh, four or five, six, six times a week, like I do, uh, then this also uh, invites us to think about our destiny. It's a very interesting reflection, a very humanitarian one, and in a certain way for us that come from a, a Judeo-Christian uh, uh, heritage and also a Demo-Christian party, I'd say that this shows that also in the Greco-Roman roots, there is a lot of humanity, a lot of reflection on our essence, and so our roots are also in this uh, Greco-Roman uh, uh, legacy. And so it's a very, very good book, not so heavy as probably this presentation would suggest. And so I really recommend it to everyone that lived this uh, period to think about their lives and to rethink about what is really important in their uh, 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 families, in their work life, in their uh, activity as citizens. Thank you so much for that recommendation and for your perspective, Mr. Paolo Rangel, Vice Chair of the EPP Group in the European Parliament, Vice President of the European People's Party. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and on behalf of the EPP, thank you for the work that you're doing.